My guest today is Professor Selva Dandaraja, who is Assistant Professor of Operations Management and Decision Sciences at the University of Illinois, Chicago. One of his research interests is decision making under uncertainty and flexibility. Welcome, Selva. Uh, thanks for having me, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your recent papers, Real Options in Energy, a guided analysis of the operations literature. Um, you say real option models maximize the estimated market value of operational assets, exploiting the flexibility that decision makers have in, in managing these assets. Inspired by the valuation of financial options, the natural uh, domains of application feature high levels of market or operational risk. The existence of financial markets are trade instruments associated with the inputs and outputs of underlying processes facilitates the use of these models. So before we get to the technical details of real options, I want to start at the very highest level. Um, what do you mean by real options? This is a great question. Glace place to start. So uh, we really think, think about it as um, a conversion asset at a high level. So you have a bunch of inputs and there's some conversion that happens, typically operational, and then there are a set of outputs. The inputs and outputs are typically traded in the financial market. And so what that does just intuitively is that it defines your objective that you're trying to optimize in a more concrete, gives a financial backing to uh, the operational uh, optimization problem. So if you have a refinery and you want to decide what your production level is, then you can decide that as buying inputs and selling outputs into the commodity market. And so you can look at the spread between the inputs and outputs and try to maximize uh, the profit. So uh, from an operational standpoint, I think the, the beauty of real options is it gives you a clean objective that has financial support, which you typically don't get. So, so let, let me take it a little bit further uh, to the higher level. So. So financial options, uh, most people are familiar with call options and put options. Yes. So a call option is gives you the right to buy an asset mm -hmm. at a future time at a pre-specified price, right? Yes. And a put option is sort of, you know, it gives you the right to sell an asset. So mm -hmm. those things, you know, we have had financial options for a long time. We almost have not almost, we have closed form solutions for them called, called Black Shoals, um, where we have make set of assumptions like, um, so if I have a, a call option on Pfizer or IBM, mm -hmm. uh, it allows me to buy a stock of Pfizer, let's say, uh, uh, let's say six months, one year into the future, it's called a leap. Uh, so one year into the future at some specified price, right? And so that's quite valuable because nobody knows what the price is going to be one year into the future. There is sort of uncertainty around Pfizer prices. And hence, I will pay some money for that call option. Now, real options are not that simple, is it? I mean, um, well, some of them could be simple, but not all of them. But so, so when you think about energy industry, you, you're talking about uh, natural gas, you're talking about coal, you can talking about uh, oil and gas, electricity. Yes. So, so, so uh, just sort of connect the financial option intuition to what, what happens in real markets. Sure. So, so one thing that's unique about the energy industry, picking up on the call option example uh, you gave, um, is that the if you take electricity, for example, right? Unlike the financial uh, markets, you don't you energy cannot really be stored, quote unquote, right? So, and so what you're really relying on are efficient futures markets to to write these options on. So I'll give you a concrete example. Could be storage. If you take storage, the optionality there is you want to actually time when to buy natural gas inject when the price is low, and then withdraw and sell when the price is high. But the Issue is you don't know the label. How do you label a price as low and high? Precisely because if price is uncertain and evolve uncertainly, you don't know when the price is low or high. 
So one way that um, in real options people handle this uh, uncertainty is that you model uh, futures prices and then you assume that um, you, you're in the sort of risk neutral environment, which doesn't mean that you don't care about risk. It just means that markets are complete so that you can actually adjust, ad adjust for risk. Okay. And how do you value um, a storage asset and what makes it difficult compared to a simple call or um, put option is, is twofold. One is that the current decision that you take is limited by capacity constraints. So you can't inject or withdraw as much as you want. Right. And there are also storage constraints in the asset. So uh, you'll need to decide how much to underutilize. So underutilizing right now, not filling up the tank fully, might have substantially more value if you wait two months and then you inject. And so these operational frictions are what make uh, real options, uh, I think, more interesting than um, financial options. However, we do borrow a lot from financial options. Right? So usually in, in real options, you think of a real option as some combination of timing options. So when do I inject? When do I buy and inject? When do I draw and sell? That's a timing decision. Or you can think about this as what financial uh, options literature calls switching options. So you can decide, I want to change the level of my storage asset. So I want to switch from a lower inventory level to a high inventory level. And most of the real options in, in energy operations is a combination of timing and switching options. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, right? So that there, there are two major things in options. One is uncertainty and the other is the flexibility, right? So, yes. so when you look into the future, you see some uncertainty. And if you have some flexibility to make a, a future decision, there is some value. Um, so for instance, you know, um, in our daily lives, if you say, you know, I see some uncertainty in automobile prices, or let's say electric car prices to make it more tangible. And um, if I have some flexibility to buy that electric automobile in the future, uh, for example, I can delay that decision because I have a gas powered guzzler <laughs> that I want to get rid of in two years. Um, I have some time to make that electric automobile purchasing decision. That is value because we don't quite know what the regulatory instrument is going to be, what the value is going to be and all of that. So it, it's always the case that delaying a decision has value, right? When there's uncertainty. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, the value of delaying has uncertainty and I think you, you brought up a Good point. So when you evaluate the value of flexibility, you're somehow relying heavily on a model that you create on how things evolve. And so that tends to be one of the challenges whenever you're doing a real options or even financial option pricing is how do you create a model of the uncertainty such that when you build this model on decision making that if you delay your decision to inject withdraw or investing in 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 a in the manufacturing of a car that 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 valuation was actually accurate yeah and um the the complication real options if i understand this correctly uh Selva, is that financial options are sort of self-standing so i could go out and price a pfizer call option a mm -hmm. leap on pfizer uh, using a closed form solution. It's a self-standing single decision. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in real markets, right? What I mean by real markets is, so So you talk about energy industry here. So, you know, an oil and gas company doing exploration development, um, a solar company, you know, putting in some solar um, fields or whatever. Um, these are complex, options, right? These are not single standing options. Is that mm -hmm. one of the complications? Yes, it is. So, uh, you know, one example I can give is think about a, a problem where you're trying to invest in, um, say, a hydropower plant, whether you want to increase the capacity of a hydropower plant and you then you need to decide how much to operate. So the decision on investment is like a timing option. So when do you decide to increase capacity? 
But whether that capacity has value would depend on how you operate the plant for the next two to five years. And so these decisions are intricately uh, coupled. And so the investment decision that you make today will impact operations and vice versa. And one of the, uh, I think it's more of, it's sort of a science and an art. So the original problem can benefit a lot from advanced techniques like reinforcement learning and so on. But part of the art is to figure out how do you take this complex problem and break it down into simpler pieces that you can solve uh, uh, heuristically using options theory uh, uh, from finance and so on. How do you uh, approximate this more complicated coupled problem using something simpler? So that's been a big push in the real options literature. Yeah, so so one issue there is that we have multiple decisions to make into the future. Whereas a financial call option or a put option is a singular decision. And hence, and if you assume the underlying is following geometric Brownian motion, we have a closed form solution for it. But in real, in the real world, we we don't have a singular decision. We have interacting decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so going back to the energy industry, so could you talk a bit about you know uh, some examples of you know clearly natural gas, oil and gas. Electricity, all of those are natural. All of those are commodities on which you make decisions. Um, why do those decisions are interrelated? Why, why are those decisions sort of singular decisions, like in financial options? Okay, good. So, so uh, let's take an example of, uh, say, a natural gas storage. Because that's that's I think the easiest um, and, and a very uh, pervasive application. So you have a storage decision today. So you need to decide. You see the price today. You have some storage space, and you decide: Do I buy natural gas and inject? Now, the amount that you inject today, the profit that you make, will depend on the date at which you withdraw and sell. Right. So by by definition, in storage, when you inject, you need to worry about the withdrawal decision. Right. So, so one way that people do it approximately is to say that's like a calendar option. So there are calendar options that are uh, that people in finance have studied, where you say, you know, I'm going to inject one unit of natural gas today, and I'm going to look at the sort of uh, the spread between the price today and the price in December, say, so September versus December, and I look at that option, and if that option is in the money, then I'll do the trade. That would be. An approximation, but even in that approximation, you can see that the uh, decisions are linked, right? And part of it is because there are operational frictions. You have limited capacity, and the capacity has value, so you need to decide how that marginal value of capacity changes over time. And since that value changes over time, you you the, the decisions are linked. Yeah, so I don't know a lot about natural gas, uh, Selva. So, so let's say I have a tank. I own a tank. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is my asset, and I can make sort of two two types of decisions: when to bring in natural gas into that tank, when to let it out, out of the tank, right? And so, so I have one advantage: I could look at the futures prices of natural gas. So that's sort of market's expectation of how prices would change in the future, right? So I could use that to sort of make these decisions. Is that is that how it works? You can. So that's used a lot. Um, so that's uh, so what what a common heuristic that's used is called the intrinsic policy, where instead of using spot prices which you don't know into the future, you replace it by futures prices with the maturity corresponding to the spot price, and then you solve a deterministic problem. So you basically kill the uncertainty. Um, now, the thing is, if you look at the futures price as a forecast of spot prices, for a lot of the commodities, it's a lousy forecast. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we've actually tested this in a in a in a working paper um, uh, called Data Driven Storage Operations. So it's a lousy uh, forecast. Mm. And so if you backtest those rolling um, decisions, they actually perform poorly. Although they're implemented a lot in uh, in uh, software packages, so there's a lot of scope in terms of trying to bring in data to figure out what would be the right features for you to predict spot prices when you're making these decisions. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, Sarah. So, so you're saying the futures prices 
what we can see at time equal to zero, sort of the expectations of the market, uh, it's not really that useful. <laughs> In other words, it's sort of the biased, biased view of the future. Uh, so, in the real world, right? So, usually when we do real options, we work in what's called the risk neutral measure. Yeah. And that's that's the underpinning of the theory. And so, there, futures prices provide perfect expectations of spot prices. But this is not what happens in the in 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 uh, in the real real market. And so, what we did in a working paper is we actually said. Um, what if we look at futures prices as forecasts and just compute the error? And mm -hmm. as as is well known, the errors were large. And the question we asked is, is there still value in using futures prices when you're making these decisions? The answer is yes, there is still value, but it needs to be combined with other predictors. For example, for natural gas, it turns out if you use analyst forecasts from different banks, which is released by Bloomberg, uh, if you combine those features with futures prices together in, in, in a reinforcement learning model, then it, it substantially outperforms uh, mm. just purely using futures prices. And so the interesting takeaway, I think, from, from that um, exercise is that if you just look at the predictive power of futures prices, you might say they're useless. But if you just use the analyst forecast and remove futures prices, you still do poorly. So the futures prices do play an important role. Right. But they're not enough. You need to add some more information there uh, to get the uh, trades right. Yeah, that's so counterintuitive to me. You know, uh, I always prefer some sort of market expectations, and, and futures prices are market expectations. What you're telling me is that um, that is not sufficiently robust. You need to add some information on top of market expectations to make it more useful. Yes, if you want to be an aggressive trader, right? So if you want to capture all the spot market value, because the the the, the most uh, I guess the most risk one of the risk averse things you can do is just trade in the trade forward and lock in the value of your trades. Right? So there's no uncertainty; you just lock everything in. But then you're losing the value of these price fluctuations. They could actually add more value than a deterministic trading strategy. Yeah. So if if the prior is you're a trader who wants to go after that additional value, then I'm saying that just looking at the market expectations may not be uh, the best thing to do. So so what's the mechanics there? So if if the analysts are holding private information that is not reflected in market prices, what are the implications of that? I mean, is it is it is it that they're using this private information in some in some way that is sort of filtered into the market prices over time? Or why are the market prices not reflecting overall expectations? So that's a good question. So what we what I can say is this is not the, the, the value of future prices does vary across commodities. So in that paper, we looked at six commodities. So we looked at yeah. copper, soybean, um, aluminum, natural gas, oil. Um, and so, for example, for natural gas, futures price is actually pretty useful, right? They have the nice seasonal pattern, yeah. and so they do fairly well. For uh, other commodities where mark futures prices, futures markets may not be as liquid, that's where you see more value from um, these analyst forecasts, which, which uh, sort of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the second yeah. observation, which I think um, what might make this uh, more intuitive, is that usually when we do these uh, models, we treat far away futures prices, futures prices with long maturities to have sort of the same uh, importance as short maturity futures prices in the model. Although we know, you know, long maturities are not traded that much. So the information content there is is not that high. So for those long maturities, then if you can somehow bring in additional information, either historically from spot prices or analyst forecast, it adds value. So I think short-term futures prices are pretty useful. The intuition we have is that the, as, as you keep planning forward in time, those long maturity futures are the ones that create, create issues and you need to add more information to uh, ensure that uh, they don't corrupt your current position. 
Yeah. The I don't know a lot about commodity markets, but the counterintuitive part for me is if the analysts are holding private information mm -hmm. and they can benefit from it, they can create an alpha from that private information, why would they just hold the information and not trade in the market? If they actually trade in the market, then the futures would should reflect efficient market expectations, right? Right. So, so the the analyst forecasts they are public information, right? So they're not they're not privately necessarily held by the banks. You you can access them. Yeah. Um, but your question is why isn't that information also somehow getting back into into uh, the prices? Yeah. Into the uh, futures prices. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure about that. We haven't done an empirical study. So only thing we've tried to understand so far is what is the differential impact on these features? So prices, analyst forecasts that will be different from their value for forecasting. Because real options is more about decision making. Yeah. So if you're thinking about it from a predictive piece, then we know the value of futures versus analyst forecasts. Our paper looks at what is the differential value in these features for decision making. Yeah, I mean, this is so interesting in the, it, you know, uh, from multiple directions. So uh, one is this question of, from a decision maker's perspective, if there is private information held by analysts, and you say the futures are not reflecting expected overall information, then decision makers inside a company using futures prices would be make the wrong decisions, right? Yes, yes, and that's the prior. And talking to other uh, uh, commodity players, so for example, I've spoken to folks in the asphalt market and so on, they have the same issue. There, they don't even have a forward curve. And it seems the whole game is to figure out who can come up with the best prediction of sort of a synthetic forward curve to trade. And yeah. so this seems to be sort of, you know, the person has the best expectation of spot prices has an edge. And I don't think, uh, I think that's that's a fair, uh, that's a fair take on, on these commodities. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, you, you need sort of, you need a lot more data to say that, so suppose I say I have an artificial intelligent agent who can come up with a better futures or better forward curve, let's say for oil and gas or something, right? Some commodity. Um, I might be right in short horizons, but could I really prove that I have a better, you know, let's say it's an AI agent or something, right? Could I really, isn't sort of a regime dependent? I mean, it will be very anecdotal, right? If I make excess profits in that regime. I think so. I think in the long run, so at least intuitively the way I think about it is if there is, if someone has a technological edge in coming up with this forward curve, eventually this technological edge will go away because the industry will okay. catch up. So I, I agree with you. So I think these, um, I think it also depends on the size of the market. So, you know, I was talking about asphalt. I don't know if the asphalt is market is, you know, there are enough big players in the asphalt market that they've cracked the forward curve problem. Uh, so there might be some opportunities there. But if you take a larger commodity like natural gas or crude oil, I think, you know, if there's any technological edge that's going to go go off pretty soon, it's nice. It's nice. So they, they'll become more more efficient fairly quickly. So yes. so going back to uh, sort of the operations uh, aspects of this. So the, the basic idea here is that if managers of a firm have some future expectations, uh, it's clearly not going to be deterministic, it's going to be uncertain. But if they have some flexibility to enter into contracts with counterparties, they could consider sort of optionality in those contracts to maximize the value of the firm. Yes, yes. So uh, I can give you an example, uh, uh, probably a more co contemporary example here, where there have been 
companies like Microsoft and Google that have that have been entering into what are called power purchase agreements to to buy electricity, and so they would report that you know by 2025, 2030, they would procure the electricity demand uh, using renewable resources, and this is in part to you know uh, displace their scope to emissions. Um, yeah. And traditionally, what companies used to do is enter into 20, 25 year contracts, long term fixed contracts, and what they've found over time is there is value in being exposed to the market, the market uncertainty, because prices are dropping, so you want to be exposed, you don't want to be locked in. And so the, the length of these contracts have gone down. So instead of 20, 25 year contracts, you see five year contracts, seven, 10 year contracts. So now you need to decide, you know, today, am I going to sign a five year contract, a 10 year contract, seven year contract, if so, for how much capacity, and what are the implications for me when I re-sign a contract five years down the road? And that would be an example of, of the optionality that you spoke about. Because when I'm taking a decision now, I need to have some sense of how the markets will move in the future so that I can decide if I lock, do I lock in a lot or do I, uh, do I give myself some wiggle room to, to uh, update my procurement policy in the future? Yeah, so so you have a paper in 2021 meeting corporate renewable power targets, um, and you know one of the things I struggle with is there's some sort of technical risk in power market, power, you know it's sort of environmentally related power markets, um, and that is suppose we find a technology, for example, it seems like we are pretty close to uh, fusion uh, energy. Um, and if, if we tackle fusion, for example, um, it's almost zero cost energy. We can suck all the carbon dioxide out of there. We can, you know, all the stuff that people worry about could be all solved in six months. Um, being a bit optimistic about it. <laughs> uh, so there's a technical risk issue in the environmental issue, right? So. So if I'm Microsoft or Hewlett Packard or, or some large company versus renewable power targets, um, how do I incorporate sort of the future technical risk, market uncorrelated risk of a technology change that substantially change my decision processes? Sure. So there are there are a couple of, couple of ways. So one is you know, when you do these long-term planning problems, you typically account for some sort of learning rate. That is for uh, sort of the typical diffusion of technology that you that you see. Now, there are going to be disruptions that that might happen in the market that could fundamentally change uh, change things. And part of what I understand is that that's one of the reasons you don't want to be locked in for too long, especially in a renewable energy market yeah. like like what we have uh, the second the second part of that 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 I've uh, come to appreciate is even if you know a great breakthrough technology comes up showing that showing the proof of concept of that is one thing and getting investors to back it up commercially you know is a separate thing right so just that pipeline might take some time yeah. some time yeah. uh, and you know by then uh, I think uh, the companies would catch up. Yeah, so that, that's a so so if so corporate renewable power target. So if I am sitting at a large Fortune 500 company, and the board has given me sort of a renewable power target, um, I have to look at a couple of things. One is sort of the market-based price processes that I can observe futures forward curves. Yes. Another is I have to make an estimation of sort of a regime change, some kind of a technical market uncorrelated risk sure. that I need to incorporate. So, so what do these companies? I mean, how do they think about this? I mean, it seems like a very complex problem. It's a it's a, it's a very it's a very complex problem. So, on I, I can tell you how I've I've seen uh, this had happen in practice, and then I can tell you a little bit about what we did. So yeah. in practice, they look at sort of this P99, P98 curve. So they look at the revenue forecast and they look at sort of your confidence, right? So that's that's what they look at uh, when they go for investing. 
So they look at all, they run sort of a stress test, look at different scenarios of cash flows, depending on disruptions, so on and so forth. And then look at what would be uh, sort of a lower confidence, upper confidence, and they, they make, uh, they adjust for that risk when they decide uh, the power purchase agreement price um, or the cost of capital. In, in our paper, the way we accounted for that is we were actually looking at the buyer problem, right? So we're looking at Google, say, or Microsoft deciding how I would enter into these contracts and, and then uh, potentially roll over into a new contract over time. This means you, don't, you, you not only need to predict power prices, which we assume there are disruptions and jumps, we account for that, but you also need to know what the power purchase agreement price, which is a negotiated quantity. Yeah. So the way we, what we did is we actually looked at deal data for power purchase agreements, and then we built a latent variable, variable model just because you don't have enough information into the negotiation process. So we built a latent variable model to account for potential um, factors that could make the power purchase agreement price deviate from uh, the power price, the renewable energy certificate uh, market prices and so on and so forth. So we built a specialized model for that. And then all our decisions were contingent on that model uh, being a realistic um, uh, approximation of, of, of the market. And so we back tested it and we found it to be reasonable on, on the deal data that we have. Right. So I wonder, Selva, that is there a market for sort of an intermediary here? You know, Microsoft is not the business of power prices. Um, they have better things to do. So is there a more efficient intermediary who could actually negotiate this for this corporate? I, I wasn't really aware of corporate renewable power targets. So I'm assuming that a lot of Fortune 500 companies have this mm -hmm. as sort of if they go to their um, shareholders and say we have this renewable power targets, maybe for cosmetic reasons, maybe for I don't know, uh, but if they do that, uh, they don't have any expertise in it. Is there a is there a sort of a, a business for an intermediary to yes, make it there are, there are several companies that specialize in uh, figuring out you know how to set the targets, how should these procurement portfolios be set. Having said that, Microsoft and Google have pioneered a lot of this, so uh, you know they almost seem to have like a energy. They're almost like energy producers on their own in, in some right because they've invested so much into um, into into uh, power plants now. And last year in 2020, I think Amazon uh, by by a large margin, uh, you know, invested in the most um, power, uh, corporate power purchases by some three gigawatts or something. It was a huge number. Um, and so, so they're, they're almost like mini power producers now, these big tech companies. Yeah, I mean, so Amazon, uh, I don't know what the right numbers are, but about a quarter of our power production is going into data centers today. <laughs> and so, you know, if you have big cloud infrastructure, um, you are clearly a big user of power. Uh, you might as well, you know, sort of get into the power production business. Yes, and if you look at the prices of of the cheapest PPAs, they actually beat the for wind especially they beat the wholesale market prices for power. So it's not you know it, it, it's in in some cases there is a markup because you're you're trying to also buy these renewable energy certificates and that could cost you a premium. But in many cases it also makes financial sense to do this. You can lock in these good prices and and. Uh, that's helpful for the reasons you mentioned. If I'm consuming a lot of power, then I could. Uh... Yeah, it's just so interesting. You know, any software or computer company in the future will have to have sort of a power um, company on its side because they're using so much power. Is that the way to think about it? <laughs> uh, I think so. It, it depends. So I think you know what what I see in the market now is the. Google has already met 100%. It's hit this 100% target. And now it's digging in deeper and saying that if I have a data center, say, in uh, somewhere in the US, then I need to be able to meet the data center's demand using locally sourced power. So they've gone to the next level of granularity, right? Uh, locally sourced power and power that's generated within the same R. It, shouldn't even be, it should be renewable power at the same location, same R. So they're going that way. 
But if you look at a medium-sized company, then they may not even have the credit rating to be able to enter into a PPA. Yeah. So the other direction the industry has gone in is aggregation. So you aggregate uh, a bunch of smaller companies. So you have you sort of demand pooling and risk pooling, and then you can go in. There are third-party companies that would help them um, to get a, a, a you know a PPA contract. And the last thing is, I don't know if you heard about Walmart. So Walmart has started this thing called a gigaton PPA, mm. where they're saying, you know, there's only so much Walmart can do to offset its own emissions from procurement of electricity. So that's called scope two. Most of its emissions don't come from its own operations, but it comes from its suppliers and others in the value chain. Transportation. So transportation right. and so on. And those players may not have enough of a demand to go and get a PPA. So Walmart recently started this gigaton PPA project where they are sort of an anchor and the suppliers can basically uh, try to enter into a PPA through Walmart. So they're providing a pathway for them to become renewable. That way Walmart's scope three emissions can be reduced because those are typically the most, uh, they, they, they account for the largest fraction of the emissions typically for a firm. Yeah, so, so this is uh, probably not part of your research, Sarva. I was thinking that yeah, so so we have this uh, hub and spoke model, right? So Walmart is a good example where you, you have all these transportation companies pumping stuff into a Walmart store. We might go into sort of an autonomous vehicle driven small packages delivery business mm -hmm. where you know uh, every home get an autonomous vehicle coming in and delivering whatever they need in the future. Um, which might be quite efficient if the autonomous vehicles, you know, obviously are uh, power driven. So, so I'm wondering if, um, so in the, in the, from a policy perspective, what, what would you think, I mean, we know we have an environmental problem and a lot of companies are after this to get cosmetic advantages to say that they understand it, they have to do something, but more structurally, what, what do you think is going to happen if you look forward four or five years into the future from an environmental policy perspective? I know that this is not something that, that's in the paper, but what do you, what do you think is the right, right way to think about this? Right. So, so I think that the question you asked was one of the reasons that I started working on that paper. And I think that's why the corporate movement, I think, is critical, because in some sense, that's that's happening in a, in, a, in a, I wouldn't say fully decoupled manner, but in a largely decoupled manner from policy. So in, in 2013, 2014, when, you know, the, uh, the policy, un there was policy uncertainty around clean energy, that's when, if you look at the corporate power procurement trend, it actually took off around that time, where companies said, you know, we need to step up and, and do something. So I think that's going to continue. But where policy has to help is for companies who are not the Googles and Microsofts to play a part in, right. in, in this in the story or this transition. And so I think that's two ways. One is, you know, sort of this uh, uh, aggregation and, and so on. The second, I don't know if you heard that there are these community solar programs that are uh, that are becoming more and more popular. Uh, that's that sort of, you know, if you think about aggregated PPS, sort of the low income version of the corporate side, the community solar piece is trying to be inclusive to uh, um, to div different demographics uh, and making them part of the renewable energy transition. So I think this is what's probably going to accelerate in the last in the next five years. It's happened in the last two to three years, and it's going to accelerate in the next five years. I think sort of democratizing this beyond the Microsoft and Google. Yeah, sort of distributed production idea, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so you don't need your rooftop. You don't have to count on someone's, the size of someone's house or their income level to determine if they can actually get renewable power. I think that's going to change. Or the credit rating of a particular company should determine if they are eligible to go and you know get good power prices that, that a larger company could get. So it's sort of trying to equalize that. I think there's going to be more policy to try to do that, either from the government or maybe even on the corporate stage. Yeah, I am a bit biased about this. I think we're going to get a huge fusion power plant in the middle of the country 
that's going to serve all the power <laughs> that anybody needs. But I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if the technology is advancing. I mean, France is, appears to be pretty close. But so I want to go into another paper that you have: data-driven storage operations, cost commodity backtest, and structured policies. So you say storage assets are critical for temporal trading of commodities under volatile prices. State-of-the-art methods for managing storage, such as re-optimization heuristic, which are part of commercial software approximate Markov decision processes, as to bring full information regarding the state and the stochastic commodity price process, and hence suffer from information inconsistencies with observed price data and structural inconsistencies with optimal policy. So, I mean, um, some of the commodities we can we cannot store, right? Electricity is potentially an example. I mean, there is uh, pump storage and uh, other ideas. But so 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 what 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 is sort of the the gist of this article? Data driven storage operations. Yeah. So the the gist of this article I had briefly mentioned before, which is that if you take policies based on futures prices that are used in in software that are implemented in software, and you run a cross commodity backtest. That's what we do across six uh, commodities. We run it on data from 2000 to 2017 um, actual data, and we find that um, these reoptimization heuristics that when you take a model based evaluation of their performance, they perform really well. But when you do a backtest, they don't do so well. And so that's sort of the first observation of this article. And then we ask, OK, can we use take a more machine learning or reinforcement learning inspired approach, a data-driven approach to, to see if we can improve these um, uh, practice-based methods. And that's when we essentially do uh, some sort of feature engineering where we bring in you know, futures prices, analyst forecasts, other features, and then we find that um, you can actually improve on, on, on the back test substantially compared to uh, just using futures prices. But on, on, on the other side is it's also useful to from a from just from a performance perspective to use policies that are actually interpretable. So if you look at uh, you know storage, you know that you would inject when the price is low and you withdraw when the price is high. So you think there should be some sort of thresholds that should determine when you should inject, when you should withdraw, right? Yeah. And this is known from the literature. Uh, and so when we impose that structure, when we bias the learning algorithm using that structure, you actually learn much faster. And the output is also more interpretable. Right? So the outer sample performance tends to be much better. And so that's that's just the finding of this article. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's really fascinating. So if that is true, it means that we haven't really we, we are not really using status quo, let's call it mathematics, in sort of an optimization fashion. Um, is, is, that, is, that, is that the right conclusion? Um, so, in other words, if you're finding excess profits by sort of, you know, tweaking the decision process, that tells me that, you know, that the current decision process is a suboptimum. Yes, yes. So, so you could, so when you come up with, you know, if you're coming up with a model to predict how you should take decisions, some sort of decision rule that you're going to use as the market prices evolve, you want that decision rule to, to, to belong to the class of some notion of optimal decision rules. Otherwise, if you just do a fitting exercise, uh, you might get a decision rule that's highly suboptimal. So that's the intuition behind this. So we need to use what we learn from uh, uh, um, model-based methods that have been studied in the past. So, so that structure that we used is not new. It's, it's known from past uh, theory, but just imposing that structure while learning helps. So it's precisely what you mentioned. I think you, you, hit, uh, you hit the nail on the head that you need to use the math that we know into, into these learning models. But are you also saying that um, the inputs have to be broadened. And this is a bit counterintuitive for me. You know? So my intuition would have been just look at market prices, futures, forward curves. That would be good enough to make any models. But are you saying that that is not necessarily good enough because there is information outside that that are not really incorporated into models? 
Yes, that, that, that is what the backtest suggests, that if you are an aggressive trader that wants to capture uh, the value in spot, spot market fluctuations, then if you just use a futures-based uh, trading uh, strategy or, or use as a futures as a proxy for the expected spot and then you roll the decisions over, that might be suboptimal. There's, there's additional information out there from public information. So this is not private information, but public uh, features that are available that you could use to do better predicting the spot price. So, so Selva, if I were a hedge fund, and if I, if I realize this, I can make the markets efficient pretty quickly because I have almost infinite, let's say, resources. Um, why do the hedge funds are not doing them? Doing that. So, so part of the thing is, if you're talking about physical trading, then you need access to the asset. Right? That's 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 one reason. But then you could think of a virtual storage where you try to replicate. Uh, uh, what uh, what we do, but in, in physical storage, if you're looking at a storage tank, or I have another paper on network storage, benefiting from these uh, intertemporal, spatial arbitrage opportunities requires the physical asset. So if you have the physical asset, then you can benefit from it. Um, if not, it becomes harder. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. So the, the ones who own the physical assets are not really sort of doing this and the ones who want to do this don't own the physical assets so you you do you have sort of an inefficiency in the market because <laughs> yeah yes so if if you know if the if the capacity of storage that you buy is priced correctly then you should actually be making no money right if there's if, if it's all perfect uh, then whatever the value of the storage contract is should exactly account for the expected value of these trades and there should be no value, but that doesn't happen because of frictions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems like an opportunity. Um, so, so I want to finish up with one of your other papers, self-adapting robustness in demand learning. You say we study dynamic pricing over a finite number of periods in the presence of demand model ambiguity, departing from the typical no regret learning environment where price changes are allowed at any time Pricing decisions are made at pre-specified points in time, and each price can be applied to a large number of arrivals. So this is sort of, um, is this the, the same idea like in clothing or something like that? Yes, so, so we look at a, a retailer where they, uh, uh, they change prices infrequently. So they might have like an eight week selling season for a, uh, for a clothing item, but they change prices every week. And so between price changes, you could have a lot of customers that come in. And so if you make a mistake in, in the price that you show, then you could have a potentially significant uh, impact on revenue. This is different if you contrast it with uh, a setting where you can change price decisions very frequently. In that case, what I could do is if you come in and you buy the buy the uh, product, then if I come in next, I could essentially do personalized pricing. Yeah. Right? So by by restricting the frequency of price changes, which happens in practice, you can't do this personalized pricing. So you need to actually hedge against your your model of customer choices being wrong. Sort of an irreversible decision when you change the price. Yeah, for temporarily it's irreversible and these customers come and uh, buy at that price. And so you're bearing the risk of having an incorrect model that used to optimize the price. And so that's where the demand learning part comes. So you actually want to learn the unknown uh, demand preferences of the customers as they keep coming in. So, so why do these, uh, how do these people do it? How do these companies do it? So you have some expectation of arrivals of customers. Um, there's uncertainty around that, obviously. Um, you probably have some estimation of elasticity, price elasticity of uh, aggregate customer demand. So, so what, what's sort of the mathematics behind this? How do they optimize this problem? Yeah, so they have some, uh, uh, you know, um, standard models that they use in practice. So one is called, I think, ScanPro, and then there are variants of it. 
and they have, like you said, some elasticity parameters in there. So they look at offline data, maybe for similar products and they fit it. And then if you make a pricing decision for this week, they implement it, look at the actual data that comes in for that week, and then they refit the model and they reprice. Okay. But uh, what, what we wanted to do is when you're actually specifying the price in week one or two, you don't assume that the model that you fitted based on offline data will in fact be uh, the correct model. So we, we, we construct uh, some confidence around that model and then we shrink that confidence set as time goes on. And how fast you shrink that confidence set will depend on the data that actually arrives. And so that's the point that we make in the model. So intuitively, I think about this as sort of a proportional response model. So you don't want to be too conservative because you're going to lose a lot of revenue. So you, depending on the uncertainty you have around model risk, you, you, you're proportionally robust over time and the robustness reduces and then you know what the true model is with high confidence and then you can start pricing without worrying about risk. Yeah, I, um, I I didn't go into the details of this paper, but it seems like there's some um, uh, possibilities here for you know sort of um, unsupervised machine learning. So suppose I have a way to look for patterns of customers' preferences, customers' arrivals, and I have some sort of a dynamic process by which I I optimize right. I could potentially maximize profits that way, right? So, so, you know, I think the issue that retailers have is that, at least I don't know much about this, but it seems that too, too static in their view of the market. Do you think? Um, I think so. For example, the, the retailers that I've spoken to when we were doing this work, they actually technology companies, you know, they're like service, they actually provide software for, for retailers. Yeah. And they are quite cognizant of the risk of get, having an incorrect model. But on the flip side, it's actually a pretty hard problem, right? So if you have, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just intuitively just take a product that essentially doesn't have too many, too much sales in the first few weeks, then there's not too much you can learn regardless of what machinery you throw at it. <laughs> and so, or there's a product where you don't know anything, you set a price and everybody buys in the first week and you run out of product. Then you could have made a huge mistake with the initial price. So there are some things here that are actually very difficult when you can't change prices more often. So really the trick is to figure out how can you change prices more often? I think that should be, uh, that could be another way of thinking about this. Yeah, so given the status quo constraints, when to change them and how much to change them, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. But I think, you know, a broader, broader uh, issue that I see with this self-guided demand learning and some other uh, work that's not, not my own, but in the reinforcement learning literature is that there is this huge push towards trying to reduce the amount of tuning that takes to make reinforcement learning work. Mm -hmm. So might it be energy, retail, that seems to be a bottleneck in trying to apply these techniques. And so, uh, you know, the self-guided demand learning paper in, in some sense addresses that in, in, in the retail setting because we say you don't have to choose between being too conservative or just following the data. This algorithm automatically tunes that for you. And, uh, you know, we also, we of course know the AlphaGo examples, AlphaGo Zero examples with self-training and so on. So I think there's a lot of, lot to learn from those algorithms and bring those sort of ideas into business where you, uh, where you can avoid a lot of this tuning. And then, so that's something that I've been focusing on. Yeah, I mean, in finance economics and mathematics in general, um, these things are a bit countercultural in the sense that, um, you know, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning, they all seem sort of um, not very understandable, <laughs> you know, in some ways. Uh, most economists feel that they're, they're a lot better off if you can write down an equation. And uh, sometimes we cannot write down an equation. So I think the world is heading, heading down a path that equations are not that possible, but there's information in data that you could use more systematically in decisions, right? 
Right, I, I agree. And you know the way the way I uh, I've tried to convince myself is really look at linear programming solvers, how they've evolved. Nowadays, when when you know even if I teach linear programming in my MBA class, no one worries about how it's solved. <laughs> you write the LP formulation, you give it to the solver, and it solves it. If you take a a, a sequential decision making problem, that's not the case. That's right. not the case, and so. I know sequential decision making problems is potentially the holy grail is to come up with a solver that would just solve it off the shelf. But if that is too hard, I think at least what we could hope for is at least have a black box that would give you a benchmark that someone can get started with solving the sequential decision making problem. And so that's sort of where uh, you know I I know others in in, in optimization also focusing their uh, energy on. Um, so we have a paper called self guided approximate linear programming. Self-adapting approximate LP. So the goal there is to come up with sort of a black box that if you give it a Markov decision process, it's going to spit out a policy. It's not going to ask you anything specific about the application at all. All of that's going to happen in the background, and it'll give you some guarantees similar to what we would have in a model, you know, where you would actually start tuning things. So you have convergence guarantees and so on. So will this give you the best policy? Likely not, but it'll give you a benchmark that's application agnostic, and then you can try to improve on that benchmark. I'll at least give you a starting point, which might improve uh, decisions, uh, sort of status quo, gut-based decisions that most uh, companies appear to appear to make. Right. Uh, we didn't get into this. I, I want to just put this out there, Selma, that So I've been in this area for a long time, as you know. Uh, the biggest issue in application is really incentives. You know, we still have this. Um, principal agent problem in companies. Um, I got out of business school thinking that every every manager of a, of a business maximizes shareholder value. What I found was that every manager of a business maximizes his or her self-worth. Some of it is monetary, some of it is ego. Uh, it has nothing to do with shareholder value maximization. So suppose I come up with an optimum policy well, the, the decision maker is going to sort of say, well, you know, what, what is the right policy for me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so implementation still appears very difficult uh, in this arena. Um, I don't know if you have any insights into, into this. I know that you're teaching students who go into industry, uh, who do these types of stuff. What are, what are you finding uh, from them? Um, how are they thinking about this? Right. So usually, in talking to my students and talking to companies in the in the Chicago area, it seems like there are two reasons someone might use a, a more sophisticated optimal policy. One is to actually improve the policy that they use, which, for the reasons you mentioned, that may not be the incentive. The other, uh, you know, very uh, informally, I call it, it. It makes people sleep better at night. So if I if I have a benchmark and I benchmark against wh wh whatever the company is doing, and even if I find that it's near optimal, which tends, tends to be the case in, in many cases, that the improvement could be three or four percent, but the data error could be 10 percent, then uh, you know it gives, gives the company some confidence that there is a, a, a sound model that's giving policies that are comparable in terms of uh, performance. So it's really the latter the benchmarking piece that, that, that my students say what they learn in class usually helps them. So they create whatever policy that eventually gets implemented, but they have this benchmark that they know they can trust that sort of tells them, okay, this is okay. I can continue using what I'm using. Hmm. Yeah, so sort of building up intuition at the very least, right? So if you think this way, you can at least understand why certain sort of rigid rules may be suboptimal. Yes. Um, even that is pretty useful for yes. for most decision makers and another thing that i that 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 this is from the students is that they find it much easier to explain things to to people because it's very transparent right so there's no uh, subjectivity in terms of understanding the solution you know these are the frictions that you added these are the constraints you added this was the objective this was the solution so just the interpretability of what you did yeah um, I think is 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 quite quite valuable. 
Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Sarva. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thanks, Gil. It was a pleasure. Thank you.